and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we speak about the suffering and persecuted church around the world. From a military career in the British Army to the leader of the largest diocese in Africa, that is the journey that His Excellency Bishop John McWilliam has lived. A member of the Society of Apostolic Life of the Missionaries of Africa, better known as the White Fathers, he was appointed Bishop of La Guat in 2017. To learn more about the work of the Church in this unknown territory of Northern Africa, it is my honor to welcome Monsignor John McWilliam from the Diocese of La Guat. Your Excellency, welcome to our program. Thank you. As I was mentioning in our introduction, uh, so how did you develop your, your priestly vocation going from army career to a white father in Africa? Well, it started in fact in my childhood because my father was also an army officer. And in, my, uh, in the young days, we lived for two years in the Sudan and later on uh, two years in Somaliland, both Muslim countries in Africa. And so I had an early uh, knowledge of Islam and of Africans. And then later on in my own time in the army, I spent two years in the Sultanate of Oman uh, serving uh, there. And uh, there I was in close contact with, uh, with Muslims of different, uh, different schools, different denominations. And uh, I came to feel at that time that it was such a shame that people of faith who prayed, who fasted, uh, who uh, sought to do the will of God, uh, as indeed I hoped that I would as well as a layman that I was, um, and yet we couldn't pray together. So uh, I, I then felt uh, as the years went on and then I came to different roles, particularly a time in London in the Ministry of Defence where there was uh, a lot of opportunity to go to Mass every day if I wanted to, and uh, comparing that to a country where there was only one priest in a huge country, a missionary priest, uh, that I thought that uh, perhaps uh, it was time for me to hear the Lord's call to go and uh, offer what I could, in particular to the missions among the Muslims and perhaps in Africa. And hence, uh, after some discernment and visits to different congregations, I finished up with the White Fathers, the missionaries of Africa. Of course, they are the ideal option. With, 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 with those uh, conditions, they would be the first, the first option. So you're, I guess you're fluent in Arabic. I would like to be, except that my first appointment was not in an Arabic-speaking part of the world. Uh, I'd studied, of course, classical Arabic, and, uh, but my first appointment, uh, because of the circumstances, uh, which was going to be to Tunisia, was changed, and I then went to the Kabyle, Berber-speaking area of, um, of Algeria, where uh, a community of uh, four of our, our missionary priests had been killed, and uh, they were looking for someone to reopen the community, and it was me. What, what is your uh, Episcopal motto, Your Excellency? Well, I reflected a bit on uh, a coat of arms and Episcopal motto. And when I was in the army uh, at the military academy, we had a motto which spoke to me um, very clearly. It was serve to lead. Uh, and so translated into Latin. Uh, a serve to lead uh, means basically if you want to be a, an officer in the army, you've first of all got to know to be a soldier. And if you want to be a bishop, you've got to be know how to be part of the flock. So I hope that uh, as a bishop, I uh, understand uh, the, the faithful, the flock and the wider flock, including, of course, the, the people of the country, the Muslims, uh, in order to be uh, the, the pastor of those people. So serve to lead is my motto, but translated into, Arab, into Latin. Now, uh, describe us your diocese, Monsignor. It's, we were mentioning that, that it's the second largest in the world. But uh, what is it? It's, it's desert. You mentioned that you don't have a cathedral. So there are very particular conditions of this diocese. Yes, it's huge. It's two, two million, uh, over two million square kilometers in size, uh, over 2,000 kilometers from north to south or east to west. And, to uh, give us an idea, how many Englands 
<laughs> well, it's, four, it's 10 times the size of Britain, the whole of Ten Britain. 10 times the four, size of Four Britain. times the size of France, for those who, if I can compare that. Uh, so it is big and it's one diocese. Um, the, 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 the diocese carries the name of uh, La Guat because there's a beautiful church there which served as cathedral initially in 1955 when it became a diocese. But then uh, little by little after the independence, the, the Christians, the French military in particular, left. And then uh, when the, the missionary communities, the white fathers and white sisters who were there also left La Guat, uh, the, there were no Christians in the town and of course the, the cathedral therefore served no, no real purpose and became a museum. Uh, and so the, the sea became Gardea, which is 200 kilometers further south, where it had indeed been when it was a vicariate before. And uh, so that's a little bit more central. We have uh, 12 places where we have um, houses or pre presence. Uh, of uh, religious sisters or priests or brothers um, in different places and uh, in every case the um, the work of those people is as missionaries to um, to, to the people of the, of the place in different uh, apostolic uh, charitable works mostly according to what is allowed uh, in terms of the uh, the statutes of the association which the church is described as in uh, in Algeria, Ron. How many, how many Catholics, Your Excellency? It's very difficult to say. Uh, we provide a, a figure of about maybe uh, 1,200, but uh, it's very difficult to know. The number of missionaries, uh, for all of them belonging to religious congregations, or three, three priests, uh, Fidei Donum priests, lent by other dioceses. Uh, there are no diocesan priests incarnated in our diocese. Uh, that's about 60 altogether from different congregations, uh, older missionary congregations, or some of them are younger congregations from mm. sub-Saharan Africa now working in, in our diocese. The others, it's almost impossible to count them because uh, some of them are working in the oil fields and construction, but they are for security reasons enclosed in their bases. We can't visit them, they don't go out. Oh, you mean some migrants that from, from no, the, other countries are that are working? expatriate workers, uh, mostly from the West or the Philippines and so on, uh, who are working in those industries. And uh, uh, for security, the, the, the government keeps them within their bases. And uh, we don't have access to those bases because they're not churches as such. Uh, then there are a few in my diocese, just a few um, uh, Christian students from countries in sub-Saharan Africa in the universities in one or two places uh, and then there's a there's a few uh, Algerian Christians and then a huge number of migrants passing through many of whom are Christian and uh, but many of whom we don't meet uh, it depends whether they come to look for us or not so uh, it's very difficult to set a figure uh, but I would say that uh, I don't know more than about a hundred or so who I know uh, I know of in particular within the whole of the diocese. So, but I can add to that four and a half million Muslims who live in in the area, in the mostly in the oasis towns and so on, and uh, so I consider them very much part of my flock as well. That's an interesting statement. How so? Because uh, uh, Christ came for the whole world, and although the people of God we refer to as the Church, and in particular the Catholic Church, and that of course is my priority to make sure that uh, they have their pastor and pastoral care from myself and from the other pastoral ministers who work in the diocese, uh, the, um, it, is, it is mission territory. We are centers part by the Congregation for the Evangelization of the Peoples, and those peoples are everybody who is there, and including those of other faiths, and in particular Islam, uh, to enrich uh, their spiritual lives and bringing Christ into their lives in whatever way is appropriate and possible in the circumstances. For instance, but well, what, 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 what ways? Because I'm, I'm assuming you're not really preaching for them to convert, or, or are you? No, proselytism is not allowed by the country, and in fact it's not allowed by the church as such in, 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 in direct proselytism in preaching. But uh, if I take, for example, we have five communities of religious sisters who help the parents of handicapped children in how to uh, help their children to get more mobility in, in their limbs and so on, and uh, they do this uh, out of love for the children, out of love for their neighbors. Uh, and uh, if I can uh, quote uh, the, the Acts of the Apostles, see how they love each other. I think this is uh, the charitable 
uh, work of the church, and that is just one example. Others uh, help uh, school children with their homework, uh, helping women to, to, to learn how to sew or something to, to become more autonomous. Uh, any, any of those sort of um, activities are lived in, a, uh, in an apostolic way, in a charitable way, in a, in a respectful way to the differences that exist, uh, without in any way being patronizing, uh, can only uh, help the, the people of the country uh, to, 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 to know and to, to love and to, and to respect the, uh, the Christians who live among them, at least uh, the ones who are part of the church. And uh, that is, uh, I think, drop by drop. It's been going on for over 100 years now. The mission is working in that way. Uh, there's no open proselytizing uh, as such among the Catholic Church in North Africa. Um, that uh, enables the people to to realize that uh, hey we we we're, we're not enemies we 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 we're turning towards god and we are uh, in some ways in a parallel on a parallel path uh, seeking to do the will of god now but do conversions happen they do um there are not very many as uh, uh very, in fact very few but uh we are open and we make no uh, um we don't hide the fact that if somebody comes and wants to know more about our Lord Jesus and they, they ask, then of course we welcome them, we will tell them about it. Uh, it, is a, it is a right and a duty of every Christian to wish to bring the life of Jesus into the, uh, the lives of others. Uh, just as for the Muslims, they sometimes try to persuade us that Islam is the path we should be following, so sometimes we are invited to convert to Islam. So in every perfectly uh, respectful ways uh, each person lives uh, what they believe so uh, yes we uh, there, there are a number and uh, the the constitution of the country allows freedom of religion and uh, also to change religion but on the other hand we realize that the society as a whole uh, is not in favor of Muslims changing their religion and uh, of course those who choose to do so uh, do sometimes uh, face difficulties and have to keep uh, keep it quiet even from their own families sometimes other ones uh, feel uh, freer to 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 change their religion uh, openly uh, if they so wish and uh, so it's not uh, it's not uh, as some people sometimes imagine that uh, people who become christian are going to be persecuted or killed it doesn't happen i've never heard of anyone being killed for becoming a christian in north africa now talking talking about that uh, i mean I have so many questions your excellency but uh, so first um, so legally it is uh, the by by the constitution uh, it is uh, people are allowed to convert and, and 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 choose the religion whatever they want legally but of course there is the social pressure that it's even sometimes more powerful than 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 what a constitution might say Yes, uh, but more so in the south, in the more rural areas, which is my diocese, in, uh, which is more traditionalist in many ways. Uh, it, is, it would be perhaps more difficult for someone vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis their family uh, or perhaps uh, their work um, to openly um, change their religion and become a Christian, but um, they can and they do. There are some who do. Uh, and uh, we Obviously, we provide uh, all the pastoral care, the, the catechism and so on for those people as much as possible in their own language, which would be by the Arabic or the Berber language. Uh, it's more common in the north in the Berber speaking areas and uh, particularly among uh, other Christian denominations, what we might call the evangelical Christians, who mm -hmm. are far more numerous and there. There are almost complete villages who, uh, who have become Christian uh, in, in, in a more... Uh, well, in a slightly different way from ourselves, but uh, they have a different approach from us. But the Catholic Church is um, is, is respectful of the uh, uh, the desire of, of the people and of the authorities not to uh, go seeking to convert people, but at the same time, if people uh, want to know more and they come to us, and obviously the hum human contact, you can't do everything by the internet, uh, so uh, the human contact uh, is available. And uh, so we, we don't turn people away if they come, and, uh, but uh, we don't go looking for them uh, openly as such. Listening to you, Your Excellency, it, it's, um, it's clear that you have a, a, a very good relationship 
with uh, with your Muslim brothers from brothers and sisters from 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 the community. What do you say to people around the world that um, constantly hear of these uh, extremisms, the, of these radicals, of, of you know, of these terrorists that that take um, Islam and the Koran as their flag to to be criminals? So how, how do you reconcile these two realities? Well, uh, I have lived, and, w and we, myself and the other uh, missionaries in North Africa in particular, uh, we've, we've been living among these people for 100, 150 years and so on. So we know, we know the people. And we know that, yes, there are extremists, but there have been, there are, and in particular have been hundreds of years ago, uh, the Christians were burning each other at the stake for being a different sort of Christian. And so uh, uh, history shows that uh, humanity is not always as open and loving as, as, as we should be. Our Lord tells us, you know, to love one another, to love your enemies, to pray for those who persecute you and so on. So we should be praying for the, uh, the extremists, uh, Muslim or of any other, uh, any other religion, because other religions also have extremists, including our own. Uh, we should be praying that uh, this, these words of our Lord Jesus, you know, to love one another without exception, uh, should enter into our hearts. So on the whole, we, we have no difficulty whatsoever. And not only do, do we love our, try to love our neighbors, but they, we know that they try to love us as well. In, in so far as they can, and whilst they might uh, they might suspect us, they find us strange. We're not the same as them on the whole. Uh, they they give us all the freedom uh, to worship. We have our churches. They have crosses on them. We can go out the people. We don't need to wear uh, clerical clothes or religious habits for them to know who we are. The people know us anyway uh, because they well, we've been there among them, and we try to live as much as we can among them. Uh, whilst uh, recognizing on the one hand that uh, the, the religious are, are nearly all foreigners from different parts of the world, so we're not mostly uh, from the, the same country, but uh, that there are no real boundaries where religion is concerned, and therefore uh, it's much more the human, uh, the human values. And of course for ourselves, those human values are the values of the gospel, which we don't need to talk about, we just need to live it in our own lives as a witness. And I think that is what we do. And of course, my, one of my main tasks as bishop is to, to encourage, uh, uh, in particular, the, um, the priests, the, the nuns, the brothers, uh, each according to the charism of their own religious congregation, uh, to exercise um, the values of the gospel in, in, the, in their lives and uh, uh, to, to let it, um, let it uh, diffuse into the lives of those around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that uh, not long ago we had uh, the opportunity to have an interview with a, s a sister, a Franciscan sister, um, that worked there for many, many, many years. And I remember a, a phrase that she said, uh, we're not there to do, we're there to be. Yes. And I think that's very, very clear. We talk about the, the sacrament of presence. Uh, it is a sacrament of uh, uh, presence, and, and the important thing is to be. If, you're not, if we're not there, present, then nothing can, nothing can go any further. Uh, we, we, we need to be there. Sometimes people say, oh, well, you're just there to be, so you just sit and drink coffee with the people and you don't actually do anything. You know, how many baptisms have you done this year? You know, we've done 500 in our parish. So. We're, we're there to be, of course, but since we are there, then uh, we do what we can, to, especially in terms of uh, social help and so on. But, uh, but it's mainly, uh, even, even you go and you buy some fruit in the market, you know, the way you talk to the person selling the fruit and, you know, and you, you, uh, you know, you, you say, uh, Alhamdulillah in Arabic, you know, you use, uh, you praise God in, in their terms as well. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's part of being, but it's not just being doing nothing, it's being being. And uh, so I think it is. It, uh, I think most of the people there, uh, that sister is quite right, and I think we all would say the same thing. Uh, it's to be, but of course being, then of course we're going to do what we can uh, as well. Now, it is a big contrast what was going on um, a couple of decades ago in the, what is called as the black decade in, in the 90s. Um, the world is very familiar with the, with the story of the martyrs. And um, 
the canonization of these 19 religious men and women um, is going to happen. What is the relevance of this important event for your diocese? Well, I arrived in Algeria, in the north of Algeria uh, at that time, uh, during, during that time, as I said, to, to reopen one of the communities which had been lost. Uh, and uh, uh, our own diocese in the south, like the other diocese in the north, was uh, threatened in the same way as the Algerian population as a whole. And uh, the, I think the important thing of those, those 19 who died uh, were part of a much larger number who took exactly the same risks uh, and were some, some were injured and uh, knew that uh, our Lord called us to be uh, his disciples in that particular country. Uh, and as somebody has, uh, has once said, you know, when your friends are in difficulty, it's not the time to leave them, it's the time to stay. And our friend is uh, our Lord Jesus Christ present in those around us. So uh, almost ev everybody from the, from the church among the, the religious uh, stayed and some uh, gave their lives as martyrs in, in, in that. Alongside so many other victims, including a good number, over 100 uh, imams who were killed for refusing to uh, to embrace the or to, to approve the violence which was going on and uh, hun tens of thousands of, of, of other victims of all sorts uh, some of them uh, victims because of who they were or what they were and uh, so in that way I think those 19 uh, represent uh, or they they gave, they gave their lives and died uh, and they are Christian martyrs and uh, um, the Holy Father has approved that they should be beatified um, they, they, they represent something much, much wider and uh, something which the country went through. They call it the, the national tragedy, which finished uh, now, uh, yes, two decades ago. Uh, and now uh, the situation is, uh, is much calmer, it's under control. The country is, is at peace and uh, there is no, the, the, the population is no longer terrorized as it was in those days which uh, I have seen terrorism in other places and uh, it certainly was terrorized the whole population at the time, not anymore. And now uh, there is a much um, a greater freedom of uh, sharing one's differences. And of course, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the disputes which led to that no doubt still exist on a political level uh, and maybe also on a religious level, but uh, it's not as it was before. A new generation of, of missionaries is continuing to, to build on, on the bricks of those martyrs and by the inspiration of their faithfulness to the mission that our Lord uh, entrusted to us. And you expect that it's going to be like a spark in the, in, in the life of, of your uh, Catholic community? I think so. It's unusual in many ways because uh, there have been martyrs uh, before, there have been many missionaries who, who've lost their lives uh, out of faithfulness to the mission, not only in Algeria in earlier times, but uh, in elsewhere, other parts of Africa in particular, or throughout the world. And yes, it, it is an inspiration. I think it's, in many ways, it's an inspiration for the Christians uh, to, to remember that our, what our Lord calls us to do, which is love of neighbor. It was out of the love of Christ and the love of Algeria and the Algerian people that those, those missionaries stayed. And um, as far as the Algerian people are concerned, well, I can't speak for all of them, but I think uh, many of them are quite happy because of their respect for, uh, for the, uh, the, the people they have known and the, the love that they have uh, received and witnessed, that I think many of them were, were quite happy uh, uh, recognizing it as it doesn't concern them directly because they are not Catholic, they are not Christian, but uh, they, uh, it's, an, uh, it's an affirmation that uh, the, the, the love of neighbor is, uh, is meaningful for us and for them as well. In being in that part of Africa, in the northern part of Africa, um, you, you have to deal, well not you, but the, the region has to deal with, with the migrants trying to, to, to cross the Mediterranean uh, to reach Europe. Uh, does this present a challenge for you, for your pastoral work and for, for, the, for the religious people helping you? It does. Uh, the, um, this phenomenon of, uh, of migrants coming from sub-Saharan Africa and trying to find a better life, uh, I'm not so talking so much about the refugees who have been forced out of their countries, which is also uh, another uh, element. Uh, they pass through my diocese, uh, many of them, especially those who are going to the north and then possibly trying to pass through Morocco, 
those who are going to Libya, they tend to go uh, bypass Algeria. Um, so those are the two main routes in North Africa. And uh, there are also those who come to work in Algeria to, gain, to earn a bit of money and uh, then send it home or take it home or whatever to sort of just to find work which they don't find in their, in their home countries. Those ones are more from the Sahel countries. And in, in either case, one of the difficulties is that because they don't have the official papers, uh, they are not always able to participate fully in the, in the life of the church because uh, when we have gatherings and so on, the security people require us to say who is there and produce the passports and so on. So that can put them a little, a little bit of a, uh, a strain on their participating in the life of the church. Uh, but where, wherever possible and where they contact us, uh, we make them as welcome as we can uh, and we provide them with the pastoral care, the sacraments. One of the um, things that we can do, there are over 40 uh, priests and nuns and brothers in Algeria who are chaplains to prisons and the Ministry of Justice allows us to visit the Christian prisoners in the prisons, which we do every once a week, once a month, according to wherever we can, and uh, nearly all of them are from among that population, the migrant population. Documented migrants. Caught, caught up, not just because of their documents, but they've been caught up in, in some uh, illegal activity uh, during their journey. And uh, so and some of them have quite long prison sentences. So it's important for us to, to visit them, to provide them with pastoral care. We're not allowed to celebrate the Eucharist in the prisons uh, because they're not officially uh, places of worship, but uh, we can pray with them and we can uh, bring them Bibles, they're allowed to have the Bible with them, and uh, in their language, either in French or in English usually, depending on which country they're from. And uh, so I think the, the, the visits to the prisoners by the chaplains, and by myself as well, I visit, I am allowed to visit all the prisons in the diocese, uh, is very important because that is uh, part of the flock who are really in need. They're a long way from their families, they don't get visits from families, of course, uh, from abroad. Right. And so the, it, it is a very important pastoral activity, perhaps the, the most important pastoral activity uh, to the Christians uh, in the diocese. So that's important, yes. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Not at all. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us in another program of Where God Weeps. If you want to know more about the work that the church is doing in the northern part of Africa, we encourage you to contact the information at the end of this program. Thank you and God bless. I am